Good morning, everybody. This is Winston Krauss. I am the chairman of the Texas Lottery Commission, and we intend today to hold a Lottery Commission meeting. It is 10 a.m., and we are ready to get going. It's June the 11th, 2020. Let's have a roll call of commissioners. Commissioner Fields. Here. Commissioner Franz. Here. Commissioner Rivera. Here. Commissioner Signs. Here. We have a quorum. We not only have a quorum, we have a full complement, and that is in our recent history rare, so we're happy to have it. This meeting is being conducted remotely on Zoom pursuant to Governor Abbott's temporary suspension of certain open meetings laws during the COVID-19 disaster declaration. We appreciate the public participation and your patience. Uh, I will fumble the ball every now and then during this meeting, so please forgive me. <clears throat> I wanna take a few moments to acknowledge and recognize the outstanding job the agency has done because of this disaster. There have been unprecedented requirements set on agencies such as ours for how to conduct business. And except for certain essential positions, most of our agency staff has been teleworking from home or other places. Job functions are being performed and the agency services have continued to be provided during this time. I could not be prouder of our executive director our bingo director, the management team, and all of the agency staff. It's been a challenge. Thank you for rising to the occasion. I know that Gary and Tom will be providing us with more information on the agency's management through this unique time. I also want to go over a few ground rules, a little housekeeping. As stated in the meeting notice, requests to provide public comment were due yesterday to our general counsel, Bob Baird, and I have been alerted that there is no request for public comment. Second, our Zoom screen may have an option to raise your hand in chat, but commission and staff will not be chatting with audience members during the meeting. Uh, incidentally, our general counsel is the one who is, you know, in effect, assisting us by controlling the Zoom and I am impressed with how good of a job he is doing on that. I could never do that. Third, for the benefit of the audience and our court reporter, I ask every speaker to state their name before they speak. We need to speak clearly and distinctly and slowly so that our court reporter uh, can have an opportunity to understand what we're saying. Uh, let's see. Commissioners, I have authorized the commission staff to use electronic signatures as necessary on any orders and other documents that we approve in this meeting and that need to be signed by commissioners. We will now take up the executive director and bingo director reporter first. First item is Gary Grief. Would you like to go ahead and give us your report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. And for the record, I am Gary Grief, Executive Director of the Texas Lottery Commission. Just wanted to make sure you can hear me okay, Mr. Chairman. This is the Chairman, and I hear you loud and clear. You sound great. Very good. Under my report this morning, I'll first be providing you with information regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the agency operations and our staff. Then I'll move on to cover a number of other general agency business items. <laughs> Commissioners, COVID-19 began to significantly impact Texas the week of spring break, which started on Monday, March 9th. And since that time, our number one priority has been and continues to be the health and safety of our employees. Following the guidance that we received in mid-March from the governor's office, and in an effort to limit the spread of COVID-19 and keep our staff as safe as possible. Beginning on Monday, March 16th, we immediately curtailed the number of employees working in our facilities, both in headquarters and in the field offices, as much as possible. 
The goal was to limit the number of employees and or members of the public that were gathered together and increase the space between the employees that had to be in our facilities, thus hopefully reducing the risk of illness. We were very fortunate in that our technology team possessed the foresight and skills such that we were ready for a situation like the one we encountered with COVID-19. Mike Fernandez and his administration division team over a period of just two or three days completely outfitted the vast majority of the agency with the equipment and the software that's allowed us to continue to fully function in a predominantly telecommuting mode of operation. We were also fortunate that this moment in time happened to coincide with what we call our PC refresh time, a process we go through every two or three years to replace or upgrade our agency technology including PCs, laptops, printers, scanners, mobile devices, all those things. And Mike and his team were able to carefully select the hardware and software that would be most conducive to long-term telecommuting for our team. For those work areas that weren't conducive to telecommuting, such as our draw studio and our Austin Claim Center, we quickly, quickly moved to limit the number of staff that we were requiring to be on site, and we instituted a rotation plan for those areas to keep as few people in the office at one time as possible. Our goal has been, and will continue to be, to keep our employees healthy and safe while carrying out the critical functions of the agency. So on March 16th, we took the following specific actions. The vast majority of employees began telecommuting from home. We reduced the number of staff required to be in the office down to a minimum, and we observed CDC guidelines for protection and social distancing to the highest extent possible. We temporarily closed all of our claim centers in the field, and we shut down public access to all of our facilities. We canceled all non-essential travel and all international travel. We immediately began using the special leave code created by state leadership to ensure that leave that was directly related to COVID-19 is appropriately tracked and that those employees not able to come into the office or telecommute were placed on emergency leave until further notice. And finally, we have continued to find creative ways to allow our staff to continue to get their work done by finding appropriate alternatives to our regular business processes. Now, during this time, for those employees who work in areas not conducive to telecommuting or who may only be in the office periodically on a rotational basis, they are considered on duty while at home and they must be accessible and available from home as needed by their supervisor. All of our employees who've been asked to stay home either part-time or full-time and who are unable to perform their job by telecommuting, as I said, these employees have been using special COVID-19 emergency leave, not their own leave, as directed by state leadership. And finally, our human resources team reviewed best practices statewide, and they came up with an important list of questions for employees to ask themselves before being asked to come into the office. These self-screening questions have been just another tool for us all to use to better ensure the health and safety of our colleagues and ourselves. As I mentioned, a number of functions have continued to be handled in person here at Lottery Headquarters due to the nature of the job. These are tasks that for various reasons are just not conducive to being handled remotely. And I wanna to touch on these functions. The first function involves the management of our facilities, securing and locking down our buildings, ensuring proper signage is in place to alert the public, working closely with our uniform guard service, getting our Austin Claim Center staff strategically and safely placed throughout the headquarters facility, 
ensuring our mail is monitored, handled, and distributed correctly, staying on top of all the guidelines from state and federal authorities that can help us keep our employees safe, and interacting with our janitorial staff on a regular basis to ensure all best practices are followed. Our facilities team also further secured our facility and protected the health and safety of our staff by strategically securing the courtyard area between the main building and the Austin Claim Center and Draw Studio beginning in late March. For safety reasons, we needed to prevent the public from gathering in the courtyard or in the glassed-in viewing lobby for the draw studio, all in an effort to further decrease the risk of possible COVID-19 spread. So the draw studio, that was an especially unique challenge because the State Lottery Act requires that any lottery game involving a drawing be open to the public. That law doesn't provide us with any specific guidance on that requirement but it does grant the commission and the executive director broad authority to promote and ensure integrity, security, honesty, and fairness in the operation and administration of the lottery, thus making this particular requirement subject to our discretion as to how best to meet the requirements of our law. We quickly closed the draw studio lobby to the public and we instead met our statutory requirements in other ways. We ensured that the exterior facing video monitor that we have inside the window on the sixth street side of the draw studio provides a live video feed of the drawings and is easily seen from the sidewalk right outside the draw studio on sixth street. Second, we've ensured that the exterior loudspeaker provides a live audio feed of the drawings and that it's clearly audible from the sidewalk outside the draw studio. And finally, we posted signage near the TLC courtyard gates where the public normally enters to view the drawings, directing viewers to the exterior viewing area on East 6th. Since the studio lobby was now closed, there was really no need to have the courtyard open to the public at all. So we completely locked down the courtyard while we continued to allow access through the studio gate for our vendors who do help support our live drawings. Also related to these changes, and because almost all of the staff who have basement parking spots are now telecommuting, we've asked our Austin Claim Center staff to begin parking in the basement, providing that group with yet another layer of safety and protection. And the next function I wanna mention is our claim centers. As telecommuting does not really apply to the function of our claim centers, since their core function involves the physical payment of prize claims presented in person by our players. Almost overnight, our field claim centers had to be completely closed down in mid-March, and all of our field claim center employees were sent home. But for our Austin claim center employees, we had an entirely different set of challenges. We moved quickly to inform the public via every means possible that claims would temporarily be accepted through the mail only, and the Austin Claim Center quickly became the sole focus for all prize payments occurring in the state. We had to move very quickly to develop office space that was conducive to a healthy and safe environment for this group of employees. Our facilities team rapidly set up the infrastructure in our Austin headquarters that allowed us to process mail-in claims in two separate office locations in our headquarters facility providing the Austin Claim Center team with a healthy social distancing environment. At the same time, our facilities team ensured that all the proper protocols for cleanliness and sanitation were followed to protect the health and safety of that Austin Claim Center team. Since that time in mid-March, the members of our Austin Claim Center team have done an extraordinary job in working through the tremendously increased level of mailing claims. Our talented group in Austin kept us current with the payment of prizes to our players, which means staying within a four to six week turnaround time for mailed in claims. No small feat 
given that all prize claims of $600 or more had to now be mailed to Austin for processing. Meanwhile, Ryan Mendel, our Lottery Operations Director, and the entire Claim Center Management Team continued to communicate on a regular basis with our field Claim Center colleagues who had been sent home. And I'll speak more about our field Claim Centers in a few minutes. Likewise, our draw team, a critically important group that must physically be in the draw studio to conduct drawings, they continue to do an outstanding job in both providing the services and maintaining a safe work environment. Day after day and night after night, six days a week, our draw team has continued to come to the office, follow best practices for social distancing and cleanliness, and they've been carrying out the critical task of conducting our drawings. And without them, we could not function properly. Now, we're also looking forward to restarting a small number of non-critical functions that were put on hold due to COVID-19. The first one involves our enforcement division. With travel curtailed, the physical in-person investigations that are performed by enforcement staff, normally involving some degree of travel to a retailer location or to a local law enforcement office, those have been put on hold with as much as possible being handled by phone and email during this time. Secondly, our promotional events, events like the Poteet Strawberry Festival, events that we've typically participated in to promote the lottery, those have been put on hold until such time as those events actually start back up again and travel restrictions are loosened. Third, the precise periodic weighing of the ball sets used in our in-state draw games was put on hold pending the availability of the Weights and Measures Division of the Texas Department of Agriculture. We're keeping in close contact with the Ag Department and we anticipate that process restarting shortly. And finally, in-person periodic visits made to retailer locations by our claim center staff to ensure that IGT sales reps are meeting the needs of our retailers were put on hold. We're now looking into alternative means of how we might perform these reviews going forward in a different manner that won't involve travel via a combination of emails, digital surveys, and or phone calls. Commissioners also related to COVID-19. I wanted to next touch on the importance of communication during this time. We recognized early on that maintaining close communication during COVID-19 would be the key to our success. For the senior management team, beginning in mid-March, we commenced holding twice weekly phone meetings on Monday afternoons and on Thursday mornings, in which we have continued to focus on two things in this priority. One is the personal health and safety of the people on that call and the people who work for them. And two, the business needs and the challenges that we need to satisfy and overcome to keep our organization functioning. In addition, every Monday morning, I hold what I call the business meeting held via Zoom. This meeting includes Kathy Pica, Mike Fernandez, Ryan Mendel, and Bob Beer. And it is solely focused on our financial issues, lottery operations, administrative functions, and legal matters. In addition, every single division director has remained in close contact with their respective teams, holding meetings via Zoom or telephone or Teams on a regular basis. All of these meetings have been extremely productive and beneficial throughout the entire COVID-19 situation, and they've allowed us to quickly, uh, quickly address the numerous issues that have come up. With our staff predominantly working from home, we were obviously forced to cancel our monthly all staff meetings. These meetings are the most important tool I have to communicate directly with all of our team face to face and to keep everyone up to date on all the activities of the agency, not just those activities within their particular division. 
So to replace that, I started up the Friday email communications, communicating directly with the entire Texas Lottery Commission team on a weekly basis. Hence those weekly updates that I've been forwarding to each of the commissioners. This has been well received by the staff and I anticipate continuing those messages until our situation returns to some sense of a new normal. As I mentioned, I've also forwarded those emails to keep each of you informed and I've added a few special email communications to commissioners when the situation called for it. I've also had several phone calls with the chairman over this period of time as needed. Another important aspect of communication involves our communication with our major vendors. As each of the commissioners know, we outsource a tremendous amount of goods and services to the private sector under the Texas lottery model. Some of our vendor partners have been hit hard by COVID-19. In particular, our business partners at IGT and Scientific Games have been severely impacted by the COVID-19 situation. Both of these are worldwide companies with significant business operations in Europe and China, among other areas, hard hit by COVID. And both rely on the casino industry for a large part of their revenue stream. With the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on certain foreign economies, and with the worldwide shutdown of the casino industry, both IGT and Scientific Games have suffered as a result. A significant number of employees have been either furloughed or taken significant pay reductions, mostly temporary in nature, in an effort for these companies to weather the economic crisis. We continue to closely monitor these situations and I continue to stay in close contact with the senior North American executives of both companies to minimize the impact to our Texas operations. Our partners at IGT Texas, our lottery operator, they quickly took similar health and safety measures as we did at the outset of the pandemic. For example, limiting visits to retailers by IGT sales reps, rotating staff at the scratch ticket warehouse, and instituting telecommuting as much as possible throughout the IGT Texas organization. Our other key vendor partners, Pollard, one of our three scratch ticket printers, and Third Ear, our advertising agency, continue to stay in close contact with us and adjustments on both sides to business processes are being made on a regular basis to respond to current market conditions. Again, I continue to stay in close contact with the chief executive officers of every one of these major vendors. The Texas Lottery is a very important customer for each of them, and I can assure the commission that each of these companies is doing all they can to continue to support our business. Commissioners, the next subject I'll cover involves the actual costs to the agency as a result of COVID-19. At the outset of the situation, the Legislative Budget Board mandated that all state agencies and institutions of higher learning begin tracking expenditures related to COVID-19 and group those expenditures according to the salaries of the employees involved who've been sent home and can't perform their jobs, two, any impact to state revenue, and three, the actual cost of any special purchase of goods and services directly related to COVID-19. We've been submitting these reports on a monthly basis as prescribed by the LBB, and through May 31st, we've estimated that COVID-19 has cost the agency $85.3 million in lost ticket sales all in the Mega Millions and Powerball games as a result of much lower jackpots, primarily driven by lower sales in states that were harder hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. That lost 85 million in sales translates into an amount of approximately $28 million in lost net revenue to the foundation school fund. And it's also resulted in a loss of approximately $4.3 million in commissions 
for our retailers who sell lottery tickets. We've lost 20,215 man hours that TLC employees were unable to work due to COVID-19. That equates to approximately 13% of the commission's workforce or approximately $487,000 in salaries for staff who are not able to work. My sense is that many agencies may be much harder hit than ours, in large part due to our ability, as I mentioned earlier, to quickly move to a predominantly telecommuting mode of operation in such a short period of time. I'm sure you've seen the news reports from state leadership as to the negative impact that COVID-19 has had on state finances. State controller, Glenn Hager, recently provided his latest report on state revenue and not surprisingly, sales tax collections, oil and gas taxes, and other revenue streams were down significantly, setting up the state for a challenging budget situation. As a result of the crisis, state agencies and universities have been advised to tighten our belts in preparation for inevitable budget cuts to occur in the near future. To that point, in early April, we took the following proactive measures all of which will stay in effect until further notice. Holding all salaries at current levels, suspending all hiring for non-critical positions, discontinuing all non-essential travel, and continually reviewing our agency budget for additional potential savings. On another note, all state agencies and institutions of higher learning recently received a letter signed by the governor, lieutenant governor, and speaker of the house, asking that spending be reduced in the current budget period by 5%. Again, this was not unexpected, and the lottery portions of our agency has been exempted from this exercise. Kathy Pica will be sharing more on this subject with you later in today's meeting. The next item, commissioners, relating to COVID-19 that I would like to cover is the reopening of our field claim centers. After weeks of preparation, our claim centers reopened on June 1st for appointments only, and I could not be more proud of our claim center staff and the way they've handled this pin-up demand for prize payments. Through this past week, just up to through yesterday, the claim centers had already scheduled more than 4,500 appointments for players who had winning tickets, and they had completed more than 2,600 of those appointments, making significant progress on the more than 10,000 claims that we projected that have been outstanding during the period of time the claim centers were closed. Ryan Mandel and his team have done an outstanding job in bringing the claim centers back online at all times, keeping the health and safety of our employees as the top priority. Ryan and his team met first by telephone with each of the claim centers individually, gaining a better understanding of the unique logistical challenges each office has in dealing with a large volume of claimants. By deploying the appointment only strategy, that allowed our claim center staff to manage the volume of claims and limit the number of people in each office at any one time. A phased approach was developed to reopen the claim centers, initially bringing back employees only in a rotating fashion, then stepping that up to include bringing all employees back to the offices, then culminating with the June 1st date when the claim centers officially reopened to the public. Concurrently, with the help of Mike Fernandez and our administration team, we acquired the necessary personal protective equipment, or PPE. Local law enforcement was contracted to help us with crowd control, and the proper messaging went out to the public via multiple press releases, our website, social media, and our retailer network. Also concurrently, our information resources team, led by Joan Codel, literally worked around the clock to develop the robust appointment scheduling database that has allowed direct input by the public and our own customer service staff 
enabling our players to schedule a time that they can be contacted by their local claim center. And I certainly don't want to leave out the outstanding work done by our customer service phone bank team in this project. This group has been handling a call volume that rivals any previous level, coming close to what we experienced at Lottery Startup in 1992. When our claim centers were closed in mid-March due to COVID-19, the call volume on our 1-800 number exploded. Prize winners from around the state began calling, asking what our process would be for handling claims and when our claim centers would be open for business again. Fortunately for our agency, we have an experienced and capable customer service team who handle these calls for us. And for the past several weeks, our team has processed almost 50,000 such calls. And the call volume has been almost triple the average volume we receive at our busiest times. Last week alone, this group handled more than 6,500 such calls. Ed Rogers and his team of professionals in the retailer service department have all risen to the occasion and shown once again that the Texas lottery is up to any task. Commissioners, the final item under the COVID-19 category I need to cover involves long-term telecommuting opportunities that have been recognized during the COVID-19 situation. Regarding our current headquarters building and what the future holds for the workplace, we will continue with our telecommuting status for many of the employees in our agency. With the tremendous support provided by our administration division, the work of the agency has continued uninterrupted. I'm so proud of how our, how our team has not only adapted, but has thrived under these conditions and it bodes well for the future for a robust agency telecommunication strategy even beyond COVID-19. To that point, I've asked the division directors to start contemplating what our telecommuting efforts may look like post-COVID, and each division director has surveyed their staff and started to formulate long-term plans in that regard. There's been a wave of positive feedback from staff regarding how well telecommuting has worked for most. In particular, focusing on the time and money saved and not having to commute and the ability to have a better work-life balance. And we're certainly planning to capitalize on what we've learned and leverage that learning for the future. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report on all things related to COVID-19. And before I move on to the other business of the agency, I'll pause here and see if commissioners have any questions. Uh, this is the chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grief. That was uh, comprehensive and impressive. And so uh, my hat, uh, I tip my hat to the great people that work for you and the great work that you and your leadership team have done. Commissioners, do you have any questions? <clears throat> Hearing no questions, thank you, Gary. Uh, I guess the next item actually on our agenda is to hear from our uh, bingo director. Mr. Chairman, I still have a few business items I need to cover first. Okay, please proceed. Okay. First item involves our move to our new headquarters. With COVID-19 requiring our full attention, one item I have not mentioned to the commissioners in quite a while is our anticipated headquarters move in 2022 to the new state office building under construction on the north side of the Capitol on Congress Avenue. Mike Fernandez and his team are continuing to work very closely with the Texas Facilities Commission on all the details related to that move. But of particular interest to us will be any adjustments that the Facilities Commission may be considering to the building design and the layout as a result of COVID-19. And our interest was further piqued in this regard based on comments that came from the most recent board meeting of the Facilities Commission. The broad based success and savings realized by having a large number of employees who telecommute, design changes related to social distancing, enhanced cleaning protocols. These are just a few of the important factors that the TFC is now considering 
as they look at the design for our space and other space in that building and other new state buildings going up for all the agencies involved. The world of commercial office space has significantly changed in the last 60 days. And we anticipate that plans for our new office space will change as well. And I'll keep the commissioners apprised as those things develop. More recently, I wanna update the commissioners on impact to our headquarters building on 6th Street as a result of protests that have taken place in Austin. Located so close to Austin Police Department headquarters and the entertainment district, there have been some limited outbreaks of looting and property damage in the immediate vicinity of our headquarters building. Mike Fernandez and his team are keeping in close contact with local law enforcement on these activities. And as a result, and in an abundance of caution for our employees, we began closing the headquarters building each day at 3 o'clock p.m. beginning last Wednesday, June 2nd, and we continued that practice through Friday of that week, June 4th. We've now gone back to a regular business day schedule. Concurrently, we moved our drawings team from our 6th Street studio location to our backup drawing site in North Austin. And we will continue to conduct our drawings at the backup location through the end of this week with plans to move back in and begin using our 6th Street Draw Studio beginning June 15th. That said, we understand this is a fluid situation and we will be monitoring that very closely. The next item I need to update the Commission on involves the implementation of what's called CAPS, the Centralized Accounting and Payroll Personnel System. This system, which is overseen by the Controller of Public Accounts, is going to become the system on which our agency will manage payroll and leave accounting. Regardless of the COVID-19 situation, the implementation of CAPS has continued on schedule without delay. The CAP system is going to impact every employee in our agency, and it's been a major undertaking thus far, primarily by our teams in the Human Resources, Office of Controller, and Administration Divisions. Our agency is scheduled to go live with CAPS on July 1st, and user acceptance testing on the part of our staff is in full swing, and by all reports is going extremely well. Commissioners, the next item I want to touch on involved, involves lottery sales and revenue, and you'll hear a detailed report from Kathy Pike and Robert Trelawney later today. You may have noticed some news reports around the country and around the world in which there was some level of criticism by the media of lotteries continuing to operate in the face of COVID-19. As one reads these reports, it's always important to understand that there are those who are critical of lotteries, no matter what the situation. So I always take criticism of what we do with that in mind. But I also remember that lottery sales are a key financial contributor to not just our beneficiaries, education and veteran services, but to the economic sustainability of the almost 20,000 retailer locations in Texas that sell our lottery products, the vast majority of which have been deemed essential throughout COVID-19 by our state and federal leaders. Our entire team is proud that the Texas Lottery has played a role in helping keep those retailer locations open and economically viable throughout COVID-19. Now, while COVID-19 has been different in every state, the severe impact in some states that participate in our Mega Millions and Powerball games has had a very negative effect on those games for all participating states, especially in how the starting jackpot amounts can be set and funded and the speed at which those jackpots can roll. Both the Powerball and Mega Millions game groups have made significant changes to the starting jackpot levels and role processes as a result. And I was a strong proponent of these changes. Starting jackpots no longer have a required minimum 
and instead are now being set by the elected officers of these games. And these amounts will be based on real-time sales and interest rate data, which can fluctuate wildly during this time of COVID-19. These changes have already served both games well, partially limiting our exposure to unfunded jackpots. For scratch tickets and in-state Texas daily draw games, sales have taken a roller coaster ride since mid-March. Sales for these games initially turned negative as shelter in place orders spread rapidly throughout our state in mid-March, with many of our players unable to buy tickets during that time. And we experienced four weeks of down sales, but also pin up demand for these products at the outset of COVID-19. Now, understanding that almost all of the 20,000 retailer locations where lottery tickets are sold were deemed essential service locations, in mid-April, sales for scratch tickets began remarkably turning around. The pinup demand for the scratch ticket product the closing of all the casinos in surrounding states, the lack of availability of other entertainment options, along with the prior and expected growth trends that we were already seeing for scratch tickets of approximately 7 to 10% prior to the arrival of COVID. All of those factors have contributed to a strong resurgence in scratch ticket sales beginning in late April and continuing through the present time. In fact, we have set an all-time weekly record for scratch ticket sales in four of the last six weeks, culminating in a new record of $128.2 million sold last week. Draw sales for our in-state games, particularly our daily games of pick three and daily four, have also been performing extremely well. And Kathy and Robert will share more details with you about that later. Commissioners, the last time you met was on February 13th. And in that meeting, you were told that sales for the fiscal year were down $81 million through the week ending February 8th for the fiscal year. Since that time, as a result of the robust sales for scratch tickets and daily draw games, we're now more than almost $57 million ahead of last year's record sales pace, completely turning that situation around. That turnaround is not luck. That turnaround has been realized as a result of good planning and sound business practices. There are several key activities and actions that played a role in allowing us to reach these current sales levels. Effective RFP development and contract negotiations with key vendors, game planning sessions, scratch ticket working paper execution, retailer player and media communication, strategic game closings. The list goes on and on. These are just a handful of the many activities and actions that go into developing and implementing our product portfolio strategy all of which contribute to record-breaking sales. And as you know, commissioners, these sales provide critically needed revenue for public schools and veteran services in Texas, particularly important during these challenging budgetary times for our state. So we at the Texas Lottery are doing all we can to ensure our lottery retailers are provided with the necessary support products, and promotion to continue this trend. Commissioners, the last item I need to cover with you today is the Survey of Employee Engagement, or SEE, as it's known. Jan Thomas, our Human Resources Director, provided you with an executive summary of the survey results earlier this week. Every two years, the agency takes advantage of this employee survey tool and it's conducted by the Institute of Organizational Excellence, an organization under the auspices of UT. State leadership encourages all state agencies and institutions to participate in this survey tool. Our survey results at this agency have been outstanding for several years, 
But this was somewhat of an unusual year in that COVID-19 hit our agency during the last week in which the staff could still reply. So I wasn't sure what type of response rate we were going to get. And quite frankly, with all that was going on with COVID-19, I lost track of the SCE. That said, the final results have now come in and they've been posted on the agency intranet for all agency staff to review. Two years ago, we hit an all-time high score on the SEE for our agency of 406, 406. According to the administrator of the SEE, and I quote, the overall score is a broad indicator for comparison purposes with other entities. Scores above 350 are desirable, and when scores dip below 300, there should be cause for concern. Scores above 400 are the product of a highly engaged workforce, end quote. Commissioners, I said on the record two years ago that I believe that our score at that time put us at or near the top of all state agencies. I also said at the time that I believed it would be extremely challenging for us to approach that mark again. But fast forward to this year. With 88% of our staff responding to the survey, even without the last week being available to them, our overall score actually increased to 417, which was deeply gratifying. Regarding that participation rate of 88%, the SEE survey administrator states that, and I quote, as a general rule, participation rates higher than 50% suggests soundness of the survey results, while rates lower than 30% may indicate problems, end quote. At 88%, our response rate is considered extremely high, and thus the results are considered sound. So I feel very confident that we were able to obtain valid results from the survey this year. Although I haven't seen the results from other agencies as yet, I'm confident that our response rate of 88% will be at or near the top of all state agencies of similar size. That response rate also suggests to me that our staff trust us enough to take the survey and take the time to give us the important feedback that they can provide us to help just do a better job as management. In addition, we saw improvement in every one of the survey categories. These are known as constructs from the survey that was performed two years ago. And I'm again confident that our overall score of 417 will land at or near the top of all agencies of similar size. Now, commissioners, these survey results are important to us for two reasons. One, we recognize there's always room for improvement in every division of the agency. And we're going to focus, as we always do, on any scores, no matter where they were achieved in the agency, that we don't believe meets our high standards and expectations. And second, this report will be provided to the legislature in advance of the upcoming legislative session. So it's very important that we're viewed by the legislature as an agency that respects and appreciates its team members. And I believe the survey results this year do just that. With that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report this morning. I apologize for the length of it, but we had a lot of ground to cover and I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, it was a lot to cover and I'm glad that uh, to hear about it. Uh, any uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the executive director? All right, uh, hearing none, let's move on then to hear from our bingo director, Tom. Good morning, Chairman Krause and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Tom Hansen, and I am the Acting Director of the Charitable Bingo Division. To supplement Gary's remarks, I also want to note for the record the activity of the Bingo Division in the past four months since my appointment, along with our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to the closure of most, if not all, active bingo in the state of Texas. Due to the number of job vacancies, the bingo division has operated at approximately 60% of its authorized staffing. This staff is dedicated to the agency, the division, and the bingo industry. 
They continue to fulfill the overall mission and perform essential functions even during these unusual times. As you are aware, the statutorily required biannual report was recently submitted to the governor, the lieutenant governor, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and the chairs of the standing committees with jurisdiction over bingo. The data in that report include the following information for the past two calendar years. In 2018, the adjusted gross receipts reported by the bingo industry was $190.3 million with net proceeds of $32.9 million, or 17.31% of the adjusted gross receipts. In comparison, for calendar year 2019, the adjusted gross receipts was $192.8 million, a small increase, with net proceeds of $30.5 million, or a 15.8% of the adjusted gross receipts, which is a small decline. On March 19th, the commission received a written request from Texas Charity Advocates, the Bingo Interest Group, and other affected parties asking for specific statutory relief to address the closure of bingo halls throughout Texas due to the COVID-19 disaster. With these closings, licensed organizations were unable to generate funds through the conduct of bingo games for their charitable purposes. The request was based on Governor Abbott's disaster declaration of March 13th, which in part authorized the governor to suspend certain regulatory statutes. The industry's request outlined five specific items related to current statutory bingo requirements. As you're aware, based on the thorough review of by commission staff, select items were forwarded to the governor's office for consideration. That request was declined and commission staff then looked to possible administrative relief that could potentially be provided to bingo licensees. After commission staff reviewed the Bingo Enabling Act and administrative rules, we were able to identify a rule provision which allowed the division to extend the deadline for submitting quarterly reports and prize fees for a period of 90 days, which staff felt would provide some relief to the industry. The allowance for this extension was communicated to the industry via messages post on the agency's website and emails sent to the mass email listing. Letters were also sent to late filers making them aware of the extension availability. A message was also posted to advise local jurisdictions of the agency's actions, which could affect their timely receipt of portions of the prize fees. Organizations who applied for and were approved for the extension have until July 27th of 2020 to submit those first quarter to submit those first quarter reports and prize fees and they will then avoid any penalties or interest as of june 8th of 2020 we have received quarterly reports for the first quarter from about 75 percent of the licensed entities the commission staff has been in regular contact with licensees and representatives of the bingo industry throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and fielded questions ranging from when can they conduct bingo again? Were they allowed any allowances for additional payment methods? As well as what can they do with the federally sponsored paycheck protection plan uh, program and other loan programs that have been offered to organizations? We have methodically worked through this and to be responsive to the wide range of inquiries we have received throughout these three months. During this time, all field work 
and organization contacts related to audit activities have been placed on hold. The audit staff used the suspension of active audits to develop the limited scope and fi financial desk review audits, which should create a more efficient and productive auditing function in the future. This should also lead to an increase in the number of audits that can be conducted and reduce the staffing hours per audit. Audit staff also attended training to maintain their certifications or to expand their knowledge. Our headquarters staff moved to a maximum telecommuting environment with only the critical and necessary staff coming into the office to process things they could not do at home. The telecommuting staff continued to field calls, process license requests, conduct research, and complete special projects, or also attend training. All critical and essential duties of the division are being done with a limited number of common tasks which were delayed due to the limited staff, system access authorization, or additional duties assigned. Prior to the COVID-19 response, Commission staff met with the Rules Subcommittee of the Bingo Advisory Committee and industry representatives on the Quadrennial Rules Review. That interaction, Commissioners, was, with the industry was very well received and very productive. Division staff also used the telecommuting environment to review and modify operational forms and instructions used by the licensees. Staff also reviewed, modified, and obtained approval for changes to the online required training modules for organization chairpersons and designated agents. And that is still available to all of the bingo workers or interested parties. During this time, staff also uncovered system issues that were the, were the result of the implementation of House Bill 914, which affected the amount of charitable distributions required for some organizations. After discussion with industry representatives, the bill author, Representative Sanfronia Thompson, provided a letter of legislative intent, which allowed for a system change for the calculation of charitable distributions to take into account not only the prize fees due the state, but also the prize fees due to the local jurisdictions. The division has also been involved in two internal audits, one related to the implementation of HB 914, and the other is a review of division enforcement activity. As halls were allowed to open by local jurisdiction approval or Governor Abbott's later executive orders, staff has fielded a large number of licensing requests and operational questions. Many halls opened with a 25% occupancy limitation along with certain distancing and personal protective measure requirements. As of May 22nd of 2020, most halls could then expand to 50% occupancy along with the protective measures. I want to th extend my thanks to you, the commissioners, for your support. I'd also like to recognize the de dedicated service of the bingo staff and the involvement and assistance from every division of the commission. Commissioners, that is the extent of my report, and I would be willing to answer any questions that you may have. This is the chairman, and Tom, I want to thank you for a very comprehensive report uh, and rising to the occasion. And uh, commissioners, do you all have any questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, Moving on, we are now going to hear from Trace Smith, of our, who is the chairman of our Bingo Advisory Committee. Trace? Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. Glad to be here today. Um, my report will be pretty short but pretty sweet. Um, 
for the first time in, in history that I'm aware of, charitable bingo in the state of Texas closed statewide for the most part, which is incredible. We also need to realize that that means all the money that the charities were not raising. Many continued to pay expenses such as rent, electricity, gas, and water and insurance. Many charities have spent thousands of dollars on upgrades and precautionary shields and dividers, masks, gloves, and tons of hand sanitizer to reopen. Some charities have even also seized the opportunity to do complete remodels of their halls to help with the new restrictions. In reopening, some, if not all halls, have had reduced attendance due to the fears of COVID-19. We expect to see the charitable, charitable distributions down this year considerably. I'd like to thank Tom Hansen and the staff at the Charitable Bingo Operations Division and the commissioners for helping the charities to have more time to get their filing done efficiently and proper and keeping the safety in mind of not only the charities, but the staff as well. The Bingo Advisory Committee worked with and alongside the staff in these matters. We also worked with the staff on the quadrennial rule review, and it was very productive. We are still searching for another member and trying to secure new names to have in a wedding list in case of another opening. That concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, Trace. I'm glad you did not have to drive down from Texar, Canada to make this report. Unless you did, and you're here in town. So I did not, sir. I am, I am alive and well in Far East Texas. Outstanding. All righty. Well, moving on to uh, Mr. Mike Fernandez. Uh, you have a report on the uh, contract for internal audit services. Mike? Are we having a bit of a technical difficulty or is it just me? Uh, that's probably me. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. You sound great. <laughs> I apologize. Good morning, uh, commissioners. For the record, I'm Mike Fernandez, Director of Administration. Item number five in your notebook is an action item. Staff is seeking commission approval to extend our current contract with our internal auditor, McConnell Jones, for a one-year period. Commissioners have independently confirmed they have no financial interest in McConnell Jones. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, this is the chairman, and I don't have any questions, but I do want to say that uh, uh, the McConnell firm and Darlene in particular has done a fantastic job for our commission over the years. I can't tell you how happy I am to have them. I was here before we had them, and I know, you know, what that was like, and so I can assure everyone that uh, this is a great thing to have this firm and this lady on board. So other commissioners, do you have questions or comments? Hearing none, I, is there a motion to approve the contract extension? So moved. Second. Second. All right, all in favor say aye, one at a time. Aye. 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 It's unanimous. So anyway, we'll have electronic signatures at a later time. Uh, the next item is our hub report on minority business participation. Eric Williams, your item. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Eric Williams, coordinator of the Lottery Commission's historically underutilized business program or hub program. As you're aware, the hub program is a statewide initiative that provides assistance and contracting opportunities to minority, women, and service disabled veteran-owned businesses. I'd like to provide a brief update on our program 
before, before I speak about the Minority Business Participation Report. At the beginning of each fiscal year, the agency sets its annual internal hub goals as required by the comptroller's rules. This year's goals and a set of summary reports were sent to you last fall. As part of the outreach to hubs, the Lottery Commission has a mentor protege program. This is an ongoing initiative to match hub vendors with mentor companies who assist with specific business development goals. The Lottery Commission also conducts an annual hub forum to provide information and networking opportunities to hub vendors. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, this year's event is canceled. A copy of the agency's finalized fiscal year 2019 Minority Business Participation Report is included in your notebooks today. This is an annual report which is required by Section 466.107 of the State Lottery Act and must be made available to the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House, and members of the Legislature. The report documents minority and hub participation in our agency's contracting activity and includes information on the number of licensed minority retailers. During year 2019, the agency achieved an overall participation rate of 17.66% in its minority hub contracting activity, which represented a decrease of 3% of three percentage points from our 2018's performance of 20.69%. In addition, of the 20 largest spending state agencies and universities, the Lottery Commission ranks six by overall hub percentage. During the reporting period, the agency also had 8,103 minority retailers, which represented 44.39% of the Texas Lottery's total retailer base. I will be happy to answer any questions regarding this report at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any questions. I do, uh, I have been alerted that this is an action item. And so, uh, first of all, commissioners, are there any questions about this? All right, well, uh, hearing none, I'd just like to say that I'm very proud that our agency is always a leader in, uh, in this particular area, and I hope that we continue to do that. So anyway, uh, even though uh, there is anything in our agenda about this, I am asking for a motion to approve this report. May I have a motion? Move to accept the HUB report. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Improvement area one. Uh, that, that sounded like that was unanimous to me. So anyway, congratulations. We've improved. We've uh, uh, considered that report uh, and accepted it. So the next item is Mr. Baird's item. Bob. Morning, commissioners. I'm Bob Beard, general counsel. Today, under item seven, I'm asking the commission to readopt all of the agency's rules as the final step in the quadrennial rule review required by the Texas Administrative Procedure Act. Your notebook contains three documents to submit to the Texas Register to readopt the rules located at Title 16, Texas Administrative Code, Chapters 401, titled Administration of State Lottery Act, 402, titled Charitable Bingo Operations Division, and 403, titled General Administration. The commission initiated this proceeding on October 10th, 2019, pursuant to Texas government code 2001.039, which requires a state agency to review all of its rules every four years. The review must include an assessment of whether the reasons for adopting each of the rules continue to exist. The commission's notice of intent to review the rules was published on October 25th, 2019. We received no comments on chapters 401 and 403, although staff identified a number of potential updates and clarifications to these rules. The commission did receive comments on the chapter 402 bingo rules and consulted with the bingo advisory committee. 
and these items are addressed in the document in your notebooks. As a result of the rule review, Commission staff believes the reasons for adopting each of the rules continue to exist, and that some of the rules in these chapters need to be amended, and one rule we identified in lottery uh, needs to be repealed. Those amendments will be proposed in separate rulemaking proceedings, one of which is coming up as the next item on the agenda today. We recommend that the Commission readopt the rules and conclude the rule review process, and we will be back in four years to do this again. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, this is your chairman. Thank you very much. I don't have any questions. Any other, uh, any questions for my commissioners? Hearing none, I may ask, I ask for a motion to readopt the commission's rules. Move that we readopt the commission's rules uh, as per our general counsel's recommendation. Right. I agree with that. Second. Sounded like a second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Outstanding. It sounds like that is uh, unanimous. So uh, thank you, Bob. Thank Let's you. Uh, move on now to uh, a lottery rule proposal. Ms. Wolf. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. For the record, Kyle. my name is Mr. Wolf. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kyle Wolf, Assistant General Counsel. Item eight in your notebook contains a proposal to amend 21 of the Commission rules and Title 16, Chapter 401 of the Texas Administrative Code. These proposed rule amendments are the result of the quadrennial rule review that is detailed in Item 7 of your notebooks. The proposed amendments will simplify and update the rules to conform to industry best practices, and they update and clarify certain terms, conform usage of those terms throughout the rules. These proposed amendments move the draw game play slip and entry of play provisions from specific draw game rules to the definitions rule and the general draw game rule with language that will apply consistently to all draw games. The proposed amendments also move general provisions regarding authorized promotions and retail incentives from individual draw game rules to the general draw game rule. And for consistency purposes, the amendments update the various game trademarks and definitions of Playboard. The proposed amendments to the standard penalty chart and the suspension and revocation of license rule update and clarify lottery enforcement policy and practice. The amendments also remove certain outdated requirements from the licensing and retailer rules. Finally, the proposed amendments include the repeal of Rule 401.322, the Texas Triple Chance Draw Game Rule, because that draw game is no longer offered, and references to Lotto Texas Winner Take All were also removed from Rule 401.305, the Lotto Texas Draw Game Rule, because that promotion was never implemented. Staff is recommending that the Commission initiate the rulemaking process by publishing these proposed amendments in the Texas Register to receive public comment for a period of 30 days. And I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Very comprehensive. Uh, doing a lot of work here in this uh, particular agenda item, and I appreciate that. So, uh, Commissioners, we have any questions, comments? Uh, hearing none, I have none. Then. Uh, I am looking for a motion to publish the rule proposals for public comment. Don't be shy. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Mike. Aye. Uh, passed by unanimous consent. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Kyle. Next item is the 2020 Census Awareness Initiative by Ryan Mendel. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Ryan Mendel, Lottery Operations Director. I'm gonna brief you on two items today. First, I wanted to make you aware of our agency's efforts to promote awareness of the 2020 Census. The Texas Secretary of State asked agencies to help communicate about the Census. The census is vital to our state because the data gathered is used to allocate federal funding for housing, healthcare, education, and transportation. The population numbers are also used to determine congressional representation and boundaries. The Texas Lottery was able to promote awareness of the 2020 census in a number of ways. We started with a simple, straightforward message. 
shape your future, participate in the 2020 census. We are able to place that messaging directly on our draw game tickets. We also placed it on digital monitors in over 17,000 retail locations across the state. We placed it on the Texas Lottery homepage, on our social media platforms, on posters at our 16 claim centers across the state, on our on-hold phone recording, and as a direct message to our email and text subscribers. All of this messaging ran from at least March to May of this year. The Texas Lottery is in a unique position among most state agencies with the many platforms we have to speak to Texas res residents. This campaign was an agency-wide effort and I believe it was a great success for the state. The next item is also mine and I am pleased to provide you an update today on the agency's responsible gambling or as we refer to it, RG, Certifications and Initiatives. In 2016, the World Lottery Association, or WLA, awarded the Texas Lottery Level 3 RG certification. In the next few weeks, we will be submitting documentation to recertify our Level 3 status. And we have embarked on the process for achieving level four, the highest level of WLA RG accreditation. In 2018, the North American Association of State and Provincial Lotteries, NASPL, and the National Council on Problem Gambling, NCPG, jointly certified that we were compliant with their RG verification standards. In 2019, the two organizations introduced a parallel process for lotteries that completed the WLA certification. As a participant in the first round of this new program, we were not only verified, but our NASPL NCPG level was upgraded and extended until 2021. Based on the results of our upcoming WLA submissions, the NASPL NCPG parallel verification will be updated in 2021. Commissioners, these certifications illustrate our commitment to encouraging responsible participation in lottery games and to increasing awareness of the signs of problem gambling and the resources available for help. As an active member of WLA, NASPL, and NCPG, we support their initiatives, including the Gift Responsibly campaign during the holidays and Problem Gambling Awareness Month each March. During both of those campaigns, we implement extensive communications to retailers, players, our employees, as well as the employees of IGT and our advertising agency third year. We recognize that our retailers are often the front line for providing RG information. IGT sales reps provide on-site training to over 18,000 retailers every year. In addition, employees, the Texas Lottery, IGT, and Third Year participate in required annual RG training courses. Unlike many other states, there is no active NCPG affiliate in Texas to advocate for education, treatment, and resources. So for many years now, we have been the primary source for awareness and education in Texas. We have engaged nationally recognized RG trainers to come to Texas and share their insights with employees, retailers, and counselors. Commissioners, this is just a sample of the many ongoing activities of this agency 
that were that support the responsible play of our games and to increase awareness of problem gambling. We are committed to continued evaluation and implementation of our RG initiatives while maximizing available resources. Thank you for your time today. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about our census or RG efforts. Commissioners, no questions or comments. I'd just like to make a note that in spite of the fact that we are, that the Lottery Commission is, you know, accomplishing its core mission with great success in the face of, you know, the headwinds with the pandemic, we not only do that well, but we are outstanding with our hub initiative, our census awareness and responsible gambling my only fear is, is that we're going to be discovered for how great we do our work and other things that we will be asked to take on more. And so anyway, I would hate to tax our excellent staff and great leadership team, but I want to thank all the staff and our great leadership team and our executive director for doing virtually everything that is asked of this commission done not only well, but with greatness. With that said, I think we're ready to hear from Kathy Pica. Morning, commissioners. I will have the next three items. And my name is Kathy Pica, controller for the agency. With me presenting the first item this morning is the commission's products manager, Robert Trelawney. Robert and I will be presenting from the PowerPoint routed to you by Mary Beth via email on Tuesday of this week. The presentation will begin with the data on slide two. Comparative sales through the week ending April or February 8th, 2020 are presented at the bottom of the slide. I'm sorry, beginning with, uh, the, with June 6, 2020 are presented at the bottom of the slide. Total fiscal year 2020 sales through this 40-week period are $4,997,000,000, which is an increase of $56,000,000 or 1.1% over the $4,940,000,000 in sales for the same period last fiscal year. Commissioners, when we met in February, our total year-over-year -year decline was $81 million. Better summarized, over the 17-week period, even with the impact from COVID-19, the year-over-year -year total sales decline has shifted from a decrease in sales to an increase in sales, now reflecting a year-over-year -year shift in sales of $137 million since our last commission meeting. Fiscal year 2020 scratch ticket sales are reflected on the second orange bar of this slide are, are at $4,124,000,000, which is a $342,000,000 increase over the sales figure for fiscal year 2019. With a growth rate of 9% over last fiscal year, the commission has reported six consecutive weeks of sales in excess of $122,000,000. Our most recent week included $128 million in scratch sales and set a new weekly scratch record for the agency, breaking the previous record of $126.7 million set earlier in the month. We have now had 19 weeks of scratch ticket sales over $100 million this fiscal year, and that's compared to eight weeks in fiscal year 2019. Scratch ticket sales amount to 82.5% of total sales for this period, which is compared to 76.6% last fiscal year. Our fiscal year 2020 draw sales, which are reflected on the second blue bar, are at $873.1 million, which is a $285 million decrease or 24.6% under the $1,158,000,000 reported for last fiscal year. The draw game sales decline is twofold. Earlier in the year, it was clearly attributed to the $1.6 billion Mega Millions jackpot and the $750 million 
Powerball jackpot rolls that occurred in October of fiscal year 2019. More recently, due to COVID-19, our multi-state jackpot sales have continued to reflect lower than normal sales attributed to small or incremental jackpot rolls. Robert will now provide an overview of details sales as outlined on slide three. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, I'm Robert Terloni, Products Manager for the Texas Lottery Commission. So commissioners, on slide three is our fiscal year 2020 comparison to fiscal year 2019. And this is through this past Saturday, June 6th. So at the top of slide three in white, our jackpot games are represented. And you'll see that we are experiencing a $301.2 million sales deficit this fiscal compared to last. The overwhelming majority of that deficit is from the Mega Millions and Powerball games and their associated add-on games. Um, the Lotto Texas game, our in-state jackpot game, um, is at the top. It's experiencing a slight decline, 1.1 million. The add-on game for Lotto Texas, which is Lotto Extra, is experiencing a gain of, of $1.4 million. And at the bottom of that section, you'll notice our smaller in-state jackpot game Texas two-step is experiencing slight decline of just about a half a million dollars. So pretty decent sales results for our in-state portion of the portfolio. But again, um, losses from Mega Millions and Powerball. I do want to make two comments about Mega Millions and Powerball uh, before we move on to the daily games. So besides the impact from the smaller jackpots that we've had this fiscal compared to last, the jackpots have been rolling much slower due to the sales impact from COVID-19 and the shutdowns in many of the states that participate in both of these multi-state games. So both games, Mega Millions and Powerball, have made adjustments to their starting jackpots. Gary touched on this briefly earlier. Both games used to start with a $40 million starting jackpot, and they have now adjusted that to $20 million. So for Powerball, um, they've had two jackpot wins in the past couple of weeks. They had a win on June 3rd. So the jackpot started at 20 million for the drawing on June 6th. And then actually there was a Powerball winner for last night's drawing. So Saturday's drawing for Powerball will be $20 million. Mega Millions had a winner um, just the other night on Tuesday. And so the Friday night draw that's this Friday, the 12th, will also be $20 million. So we're kind of in a real unique situation. Our in-state lotto game is actually being advertised at $21 million right now. So it's actually, it actually has a higher jackpot than both of the uh, multi-state games. Pretty rare situation for us to be in. Um, the lower starting jackpots for Mega Millions and Powerball, coupled with the slower sales, will have an effect on sales for both of these games for the foreseeable future. So I just wanted to make note about that before I move to the daily games. So the daily games are on slide three in blue font. Um, Pick three and Fireball are doing very well. Um, they are... That, that combination is up $8.5 million compared to last fiscal. Daily four with the fireball feature is up $6.2 million. And our all or nothing game is up just under $3 million. We are experiencing slight decline with cash five that's down 1.1 million. So overall our draw games are up 16.4 million dollars i'm sorry our daily games are up 16.4 million dollars but due to the uh, decline
line with the jackpot portion of the portfolio, our draw games as a whole are down almost $285 million year over year. We have been able to offset that decline with the um, scratch ticket sales that we've experienced. We've sold over $4.1 billion in scratch ticket sales, and our scratch ticket sales are now up $341.5 million this fiscal compared to last fiscal. We have some very solid core games out in the market that have been performing very well. And we also have a brand new Sevens family of games. You might see some advertising support for that. Those games combined with our core games, uh, we believe are positioning us well between now and the end of the fiscal year to continue to see scratch ticket sales growth. So we can continue to see an overall increase in total sales for this fiscal year. So in total, the portfolio is up just under $57 million year over year. And again, that's through this past Saturday, June 6th. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, that concludes the sales report. Kathy or I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, commissioners? Hearing none, uh, Kathy, please proceed. Very good, commissioners. Tab 12 includes information on the agency's transfers to the state and the agency's budget status. The report in your notebook reflects accrued revenue transfers and allocations to the Foundation School Fund and Texas Veterans Commission, as well as the allocation of unclaimed prizes for the eight month period ending April 30th, 2020. Our total accrued tra revenue transfers to the state amounted to $951.8 million for the first eight months of fiscal year 2020. Of the $951.8 million transfer to the state, $896.2 million was the amount of revenue transferred to the Foundation School Fund. $12.6 million was transferred to the Texas Veterans Commission with the remaining $43 million transferred to unclaimed lottery prizes. This leaves us with 11.3% or $113.8 million decrease under revenue to the Foundation School Fund for the same period last fiscal year. And commissioners, I wanna clarify, this is data through April. We are just now completing the May revenue transfer, so that, that gap will narrow quite a bit with the May revenue transfer. This gives us total cumulative revenue to the Foundation School Fund through April of this year, just under $25 billion. Also included in your notebook is the agency's fiscal year 2020 method of finance summary for the second quarter ending February 29th of 2020. The Commission's lottery account budget for fiscal year 2020 is $255.1 million. Of this amount, 80.6% was expended and encumbered through the end of the second quarter. The bingo administration budget funded by general revenue is six and a half million dollars with just under 94% expended and encumbered through the end of the second quarter. Commissioner, this concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Chairman here, uh, questions from my commissioners. Hearing none, thank you for the report. Uh, looks like we have one more report on our 2021 operating budget. Yes. So Commissioner's Tab 13 includes information on the agency's fiscal year 2021 operating budget. This morning we are seeking your approval of the fiscal year 2021 operating budget in the amount of $254,758,174 and 306.9 full-time equivalent positions. The budget was developed in accordance with appropriation amounts outlined in House Bill 1, adjusted for the Rider and Article 9 funding provisions. The initial draft of the budget was developed by the Office of the Controller and delivered to Division Management for their direct input. And the final draft was developed after receiving feedback from the divisions and reviewed by executive management. 
Commissioners, I also would like to bring to your attention correspondence that we received from the leadership offices requiring each state agency and institution of higher education submit a plan identifying savings that will reduce general and general revenue dedicated related appropriations by 5% for the fiscal year 2020 and 21 biennium. This plan is due to the Legislative Budget Board and the Office of the Governor by Monday, June the 15th. With regard to our plan, it will include a $254,694 reduction for the bingo program funded by general revenue. We have received confirmation from the Legislative Budget Board that the lottery dedicated account will be considered exempt from the savings plan requirement. This exemption is because the lottery dedicated account is not subject to certification of the General Appropriations Act. The letter from leadership also notes that in the coming weeks, the legislative appropriation request instructions will be released. The expectation is that every state agency should prepare to submit reduced budget requests. The letter also notes that it may be necessary to make additional budget adjustments beyond the 5% reduction required for the current biennium. Commissioners, this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Chairman here, uh, commissioners, questions? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the budget? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Outstanding by acclamation. Thank uh, you, commissioners. Absolutely. Darlene, let's please hear from you. Sure. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. For the record, my name is Darlene Brown and I serve as your internal auditor. On behalf of McConnell and Jones, I thank you for your confidence in us and renewing our contract earlier today. We greatly appreciate that. In your materials is my status report. We're currently wrapping up the CBOD implementation of House Bill 914 audit. We're also working with CBOD on the enforcement processes audit as Tom mentioned earlier today. Um, additionally, we've been following the agency's response to the pandemic and the recent disrupted events in downtown Austin. I wanted to take this opportunity to report to you that we believe the agency's actions taken to ensure the health and safety of the employees and lottery players were well executed. The tools provided to staff ensure that they can work from home without placing the agency's data at risk. The additional measures taken to process mail-in claims and the reopening of claim centers did not compromise internal controls, which is very important. Additionally, the draw studio continued operations without interruption, <coughs> even when they relocated to the backup facility. These actions could not have been successfully accomplished without strong leadership, staff support, and your investment in people and technology. We're cognizant of the current working conditions at the agency, shifting priorities and staff constraints. We reached out to the management team on audit timing and will continue to do so. As a result, some of the planned audits for this fiscal year may be postponed until next fiscal year. However, we have no concern with postponing the audits and we believe that they do not pose a risk to the agency by postponing any of them. We stand ready to assist the agency with any needs that may arise now or in the future as we navigate through these waters. This is the end of my report and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Chairman here, uh, commissioners, questions for Darlene. Darlene, thank you for your good work. Thank uh, you. The next item are the enforcement cases. Bob. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, once again, I'm Bob Beard, general counsel. Item 15 in your notebooks contains 28 lottery and bingo enforcement matters, tabs A through double B. I do want to note we are pulling tab S, which is a lottery agreed order with Wrangler and Hood County at the retailer's request and with the agreement of lottery operations. So we actually have 27 items I'm presenting today. 
So I'll be asking for your vote on tabs A through R and T through double B. In these cases, commission staff either found a licensee violated a statute or rule or an applicant did not qualify for a license. In many cases, either the respondent fails to appear at the hearing and it proceeds by default or the staff and the respondent reach a settlement in the form of an agreed order. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, we have litigated cases and we have one of those today. Tabs A through L are the non-sufficient fund lottery retailer license revocations handled in a single order. Each case was presented at the State Office of Administrative Hearings for revocation of the retailer license because the licensee failed to have sufficient funds in their bank account to cover electronic fund transfers to the commission's account. In each case, the licensee failed to appear and the judge remanded the case to the commission to handle its default matter. Tabs M through Y are lottery agreed orders. And tab Z is the litigated lottery case, Times Market number 102 in Calhoun County. This is the case where the retailer accepted points one on eight liner gambling machines as payment for lottery tickets. This is not an accepted form of payment, but rather than settle with the agency in an agreed order, the retailer wanted to litigate the case at the State Office of Administrative Hearings. The commission staff argued for a 30 day license suspension. The judge's original proposal contained a conclusion that the commission should suspend the retailer's license for 10 days only. In our exceptions, we convinced the judge to change that should to may, since it is the commission's right to decide the appropriate penalty. And we now recommend that you sign the order for a 30 day suspension as we argued at hearing. Tabs AA and BB are bingo worker agreed orders. That concludes my presentation and you may take up the enforcement orders in a single vote if you like, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, because we did intend to, uh, Chairman here, uh, take up all these orders in a single vote. And so I'm gonna ask right now for a motion to approve all the orders, tabs A through R and T through double B. Mo this is Eric, to make a motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Right. Outstanding. Thank you, Commissioners. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. Well, so anyway, uh, we don't have any public comment. And so at this point in time, uh, we are going to go into executive session. Uh, so uh, we have one important item to uh, discuss that. So I move that the Texas Lottery Commission go into executive session to deliver to, to deliberate personnel matters and to receive legal advice as posted in the open notes. Do I hear a, a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna just roll with it and say that I heard from everybody. And so anyway, the vote's unanimous and we will go into executive session at 11.39 a.m. Today is June 11, 2020. And so uh, our instructors say that we're gonna call in for that and that uh, we're going to uh, leave the Zoom meeting here for a few minutes. Okay, the uh, Texas Lottery Commission is out of executive session at 12.08 p.m. Uh, is there any action to be taken as a result of executive session? And so anyway, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion myself. I'm so proud of this. I move that the commission approve Tom Hansen to be the charitable bingo operations director effective immediately. Any seconds? This is Eric, I second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there any other business that needs to come before us? And if not, I believe that concludes the business of the session. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Awesome. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Aye.
Hi. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. And that was my first Zoom public meeting. And I think it went just fine. So anyway, we will see each other in person someday. Thank, Thank you. you, Commissioners. For and I will just turn. note that a recording of this meeting will be available on the Commission's YouTube channel uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Thank you.